right. Practice of real estate. Remember, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Co-mingling refers to meetings with both brokers and sales associates present, employing realtors and non-realtors in the same office, depositing client funds in their broker's operating account, or cooperating with another broker in a transaction. Co-mingling. All right. So yes, co-mingling deals with funds. So it's, uh, you know, you can have co-mingling in not only your trust account at the uh, real estate office, uh, it also deals with property management. So co-mingling refers to funds, depositing client funds in the broker's operating account. You cannot mix those funds together. So that is co-mingling. All right, next. Who's gonna jump out in front? Steph, all right. Which law mandates how much a real estate broker can charge for a commission? No such laws exist due to Sherman Antitrust Act violation, state law, federal law, or city ordinance. Everybody got that one, right? Let's see who did it fastest. Ooh, some movement. Mariano on the rise. Which, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 established which protected class? Race, sex, age, or religion? Which protected class from the Civil Rights Act of 1866? All right, yes, race. So Civil Rights Act of 1866 established race as a protected class. Rita on fire, three in a row. An illegal act that encourages homeowners to sell due to minorities moving to the neighborhood is called redlining, panic buying, Blockbusting or steering? Blockbusting. All right, so we had some uh, some confusion on that one. Okay, so blockbusting was due to minorities moving in the neighborhood. They would uh, they would do things such as having a minority walk a stroller down the street, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, to get people to move. Uh, steering is when you're, an agent pushes someone towards one community or another, not necessarily encouraging people to sell. Steering is more on the buyer side. So when the buyer, uh, when you've got a buyer, you say, ah, let's, you know, that's not a good neighborhood for you, then you're steering them. So you can't determine, you know, where they can move or, you know, what's a good neighborhood or not a good neighborhood. Uh, so in this case, it's blockbusting. Steering is when you uh, are pushing people towards buying somewhere else uh, other based on, you know, their demographic. And feel free to stop me at any time if you have questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer them for you. All right. Steph on a roll. In the 1968 landmark U.S. Supreme Court case of Jones versus Alfred H. Mayer Co., it was ruled that the Fair Housing Act is void. Sexual preference is now a protected class in fair housing laws. Racial discrimination is pro and property sales is prohibited, no exceptions, or state law shall take precedent over the Federal Fair Housing Act. Oh, no. I should know that one. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh sorry. So uh, this was about racial discrimination. So this, the Supreme, the 68 Supreme Court case with Alfred H. Mayer, 
was actually a case based on the 1866 Civil Rights Act. Um, so it's on the 1866 case. So that was based on race. Uh, if you said state law shall take precedence, precedence over Federal Fair Housing Act, uh, that is incorrect. Uh, federal law will always take precedence over state law uh, when it comes to fair housing. Um, and then Fair Housing Act is void. The Fair Housing Act is still active and is not void. So uh, yeah, racial discrimination because this was, uh, and remember the other act, the Fair Housing Act was made in 1968. So, you know, the Fair Housing Act was established in 1968. So it wouldn't have been voided in 1968. Um, so yeah, this was based on the 1866 uh, Civil Rights Act. All right, so good one to know. Uh, you know, Alfred H. Mayer Company. All right, many states have imposed the canons of ethics and the Board of Realtors promulgated the code of ethics in order to keep part-timers out of the business, generate revenue, reduce the number of agents entering the profession or ensure professionalism in the practice of real estate. Everybody got that one. All right, where are we at? Which property is most likely to be exempt from federal fair housing laws? A single family home sold by a real estate agent, single family home rented by the owner, a four unit flat rented by a real estate agent, or an apartment complex with a single owner. All right. So single family home rented by the owner, right. So that is exempt from the federal fair housing laws. Uh, four unit flat rented by a real estate agent. Uh, if a real estate agent's involved, uh, there's, they're never exempt uh, from federal fair housing. So as soon as you put a real estate agent in there, never exempt. Uh, always remember a real estate agent is bound by their code 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So it is single family home. All right. And uh, for those just joining, uh, you can go to Kahoot and you can join the game. Uh, there's a pin right here. Go to Kahoot.it. You can go to it on your phone and you can join the game and play. So it's at the bottom of the screen. A broker must keep records of all funds from the broker's special trust account, which is not included. Amounts received, client social security numbers, dates funds are received, or check numbers and date funds are dispersed. All right, good job. Uh, client social security numbers. Uh, yeah, you would have to have all records of when things were received, amounts received, uh, and uh, funds dispersed. So these are all things you would have to have. You would not need social security numbers for that. So, correct. All right, stuff with the answer streak of three, some movement up there. A real estate agent is authorized to prepare a Bar Association's pre-printed real estate sales contract form, a pre-printed lease agreement for the seller to sign, a real estate sales contract, or a pre-printed land contract from a avail form available through a legal publishing market. All right, so uh, yeah, I, it would make sense. So for those who set a real estate sales contract, um, you can you can fill in forms. You cannot prepare a form and this and again this is one of those things that on the exam is like a kind of a trick question because you would think prepare it I just write up the I just write the stuff in uh, but when they say prepare they actually mean create 
Um, and so when you prepare a form, then you're making that form. And so you cannot make a real estate sales contract. Uh, you would have to use the Bar Association's pre-printed real estate sales contract form. So it would have to be something that you're just filling in the blanks and it would need to be, and the reason that pre-printed lease agreement for the seller to sign doesn't work is because it doesn't say it was created by an attorney or you know a legal professional because you are not in the practice of law. So that would be the unauthorized practice of law. So make sure when you read these questions uh, on the exam, that you're looking at it and saying, okay, I can't practice law. So if I were to fill out a contract, who has to prepare it? And that means somebody from the bar association or a legal professional. So that's why this one was right and the other ones were incorrect. And again, feel free to jump in and ask questions if you have them. Which type of contract could a real estate agent lawfully create from scratch? None of these answers, a land contract, a lease, or a real estate purchase contract. This should be real easy for everyone that just listened to that last explanation. None of them, that's right. You cannot create any contract or any legal form. And so it says lawfully. So again, you cannot lawfully create any of them because you are not an attorney. All right, good. All right, so you knew it too. <laughs> All right, a broker or salesperson's refusal to cooperate with other brokers because of race is prohibited by the Civil Rights Act of 1844, Executive Order 1068, Presidential Fair Housing Act of 73, or Federal Fair Housing Law of 1968. Okay, so Civil Rights Act was actually 1866. So that date was wrong. Um, so Federal Fair Housing Law of 68. So even though you know, had that been 1866, that might have given some confusion, but the fact that the date was wrong, you know, made it wrong entirely. Um, so it is the Federal Fair Housing Law of 68. Um, so, you know, and that's that, and when it talks about brokers, uh, that's Federal Fair Housing. All right. Had a, had a few other ones in there. Okay, Rita on the move. Nice, nice, nice. Which could a real estate agent lawfully prepare? Ah, everyone should get this. I didn't know I doubled up on that question. Got a freebie. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, wrong answer, hit the wrong one. All right, Rita with the streak of three. Robert ran a full page ad featuring his listings, describing one as perfect for empty nesters. Robert's ad violated, will attract, Robert's ad will attract high quality buyers, should please, please the owners, is likely to get a quick sale, is potentially violating fair housing law. And I gave you that by saying violated. <laughs> so I uh, anticipated that, you know, he was violating fair housing based on the thing and gave you the answer. So we'll attract high quality buyers. No, well, it may. And it'll probably get him in trouble too. <laughs> so uh, so he, might, he might get both. Under the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968, it is permissible to tell an individual that an apartment has been rented when in fact it is not, advertise property for sale only to a special group, 
alter the terms of the loan for a member of the minority or refuse to give a loan to an individual because he has a poor credit history. Only one is correct. And that is refuse to give a loan. So when you think, so it's not, none of the other ones are permissible. So if you tell an individual, if you say the apartment's been rented and it hasn't, then you violate the Fair Housing Act. Um, and actually they, uh, there are people that act, go undercover and scope that out. So they'll send, you know, people, uh, uh, an Asian man, a white man, a black man, a Hispanic woman, and they'll all go look at the same place. And if you tell one that it's, you know, available and all the other ones that it's rented, then they've caught you. Um, so advertise property for sale only to a special group. We actually just talked about that in the other one where Robert violated that by his ad. He violated the Fair Housing Act uh, by presenting it for a special group. Um, so it is only refuse to give a loan to an individual, individual because he has poor credit history. That's the only reason on there, I mean, that they can refuse loans. They can't do it on any race, anything like that. And credit determines your credit worthiness. So uh, if you've got poor credit, then you will not get a loan. So it was green. A real estate licensee needs to have legal experience as a practicing lawyer, an in-depth understanding of constitutional law, a broad understanding of law and how it affects real estate, little understanding of law because competent attorneys are available. All right, good. So yeah, you, you need to have a general understanding of law and how it affects real estate. Uh, that's why we have uh, the law section of real estate. Um, you got to have a somewhat, uh, you, just like we've been talking about, you need to know like the, the Robert Mayer uh, case. You need to know the Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, the Federal Fair Housing of 68. So you have to know a, a, a broad understanding of law, nothing specific, just pretty broad in how it affects real estate. And this, I can understand putting that because, you know, yeah, we can't practice law. And typically you're going to say, please go ask an attorney. Um, and at the same time, this is our job is to have an understanding of it. All right. An exception to the federal fair housing law and discrimination is based on ethnicity, the basis of sex, economic considerations or religion. So this is an exception to the federal fair housing law it is discrimination based on. So you can discriminate people based on this. All right, everybody got that one right. Oh, oh big movement on the board. Got two players. Julia and Ashley, when a buyer asks an agent what form of co-ownership he and his wife should take, the agent should recommend tenancy by the entireties, recommend a joint and survivorship, recommend tenancy in common, or not make a recommendation. Correct. Not make a re recommendation. Uh, that would be the practice of law again. So if you recommend how they should take their, their tenancy or ownership, you would actually be uh, practicing law. Rita, way to go. A potential buyer asks an agent whether a general warranty deed or a quit claim deed is better. What should the agent say? The agent may not answer as it involves the unauthorized practice of law, special warranty deed, general warranty deed, or quick claim deed. Correct. All right, we're getting it. <laughs> Don't practice law. <laughs> it's the, the theme of the practice of real estate. Practice real estate, not law. By which system can real estate brokers share listings and commissions on listings sold jointly? The MLS? 
the MIP, the APR, or the PMI? All right. So MLS is the multiple listing service. So that's where all the listings are and all the historical data is. So that's where we can show, that's where you find where the houses were, whether they sold, didn't sold, sell, how much they sold for, uh, their history, all that is in the MLS. Uh, MIP and PMI, that's just uh, insurance points for lending. Same thing with APR, that's your percentage rate for lending. So this is just insurance on different types of loan. This is your, your rate. And this is the only one that actually has to deal with listings. All right. The term caveat emptor literally translates as, there's a hole in the exterior, let the buyer beware, long live the king, or Caesar is emperor. Caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. Good job. All right. Who won it? I'm guessing Steph. All right. Julia's got three. Rita with the come up. All right. Steph number one. Way to go. All right. So. Practice of real estate. Looks like we've got uh, got some got some practice to do. So uh, definitely want to want to brush up on that. Uh, I felt like you all were getting uh, getting better uh, towards the end, figuring it out. Uh, don't practice law. So let's jump into. We got plenty of time. So let's jump into. All right, I'm gonna put it up to a vote. Financing or contracts? What do you all wanna see? Put it in the chat. I got two financing. All right, one contract. All right, financing's the winner by one. Oh, too, too slow on the, on the chat. We had a tie. <laughs> all right, let me share my screen, get you all into the new game. All right. I'm going to make the QR code bigger. I'm going to give just a couple minutes here and then we're going to get going. All right, we got four of you in the game. There are nine people in the room, all right, five. All right, countdown, one more minute. All right, six out of nine, closing it out. All right, let's get going. Financing, what fun. <laughs> 
In a foreclosure sale, the debtor may be successful bidder and be awarded the title of the property, is freed of any future responsibility regarding liens, advertises to secure exposure for the sale, or may not bid on the property. All right. So, yes. They are able to be the successful bidder uh, awarded the title to the property. Uh, so, yes, they are allowed to bid. A blanket mortgage involves a loan with a balloon payment at the end, two loans combined into one interest rate, a fully amortized mortgage, or a single loan with two or more parcels of property offered as security, a blanket mortgage. It's in the first line of what you're reading. There you go. So, uh, and I can see two loans combined into one interest rate. So that's not what you have there. So it's a single loan with two or more parcels of property offered as security. So that's a blanket mortgage. The primary function of the secondary mortgage market includes all of the following except make loans directly to the public, buy real estate mortgages, sell real estate mortgages, or provide greater liquidity for mortgage. So this is the secondary mortgage market. It includes all the following except. Wow, spread even across that one. Okay, so yeah, um, it, the secondary market do doesn't actually make any loans directly to the public. So um, the secondary market, when you sell it, when you sell a home or have a mortgage, a lot of lenders don't actually service the loans. They sell them in the secondary market to buyers like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, who buy the loans and then package them. Uh, so the loan, they don't do direct to the public loans. So they do buy real estate mortgages in the secondary market. They do sell real estate mortgages in the secondary market. And this is what they actually do. So by buying the loans from the lender, they actually provide greater liquidity for mortgage because that frees up the money for that lender to go make another loan. So make loans directly to the public is the only one they do not do. So they do all of it except that one. Only two of you plan. The type of lender with the greatest percentage of assets invested in a real estate mortgage is a life insurance company, savings and loan, commercial bank, or a mutual savings bank. Correct. Everybody got that one. Good. Which loan is not guaranteed or insured by a government agency? FHA, amortized, a VA, or a conventional? Right. Amortized is not a loan. Uh, conventional is not guaranteed by a government agency. So your VA, uh, your FHA are. How many acres is in the parcel that is 400 by 800? 8.15, 10, 5, or 7.35? All right. Now, how many of you got that because you read it? <laughs> I hope it's because you remember the calculation. 4,305, what is it? 43567. All right. What factors does the underwriter consider in reviewing a mortgage loan application? Capacity, collateral and criminal record, credit, capacity and collections, credit, capacity and collateral, or credit, credentials and collateral? So what does the underwriter look at? All 
All right, credit capacity and collateral. That is correct. Those are the things that uh, the underwriter will look at. Um, you would think collections, um, and at the same time, collections will be on the credit. So collections are part of the credit. So it's credit capacity collateral. What their credit is, their capacity to pay for it and the collateral that they have in case, you know, the bank comes to call in. What is a borrower's promise to repay a certain sum of money to a lender or note holder under specified terms? Deed of trust, promissory note, a mortgage lien, or usury? Correct. What financing method does not use two ratios for qualification? A VA, conforming conventional, FHA, or all of the answers listed use two ratios? That is correct, a VA. Steps on fire, four correct in a row. Payment of a debt in regular periodic installments of principal and interest is referred to as a sweat loan, a straight term loan, an amortized loan, an assumption of loan, or an assignment of loan. Amortized. Uh, so uh, when you have installments of principal and interest, uh, they refer to that as an amortized loan because that pays off the loan in a portioned amount all the way until it's paid off. So that's what amortization does is it takes the principal and interest and then divides it up into payments so that it pays it off over that periodic installment uh, over time. How many acres in the lot described as Northwest quarter of the Southwest, oh man. I don't know how to pause these because that's gonna take you a minute. <laughs> One person answered, okay, there we go. The answer's up there. All right, so here's your, here's your rationale on that. So, you know, you've got a quarter, quarter of the southeast quarter. So it's 640, and then you divide it by this to get to your 10. So that's how you look at that. So you take the whole 640, and then you take the quarter of the quarter of the quarter to get to 10. You'll probably have two of those questions uh, on your test. So something like that. How many square feet are in an acre? 43, 560, 35, 680, 34, 650. Oh, I didn't cover it up. Everybody got that one. <laughs> 43, 560, and we had that in an earlier question. Which class is protected under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act but is not protected under the Federal Fair Housing Act? Familial status, sex, marital status, or race? All right, yes, marital status. So that is not a Federal Fair Housing Act protection. That's a credit, uh, credit opportunity act. 
So, um, all right, Julia on the move. The term amortization refers to a repayment of a loan by principal payment only, payment of a debt and regular periodic installments of principal and interest, interest payment over the life of the loan, or balloon payment at the end of the loan. Everyone should get this. All right, yes. Uh, what we discussed a few minutes ago, payment of a debt on regular periodic installments of principal and interest. Um, so balloon payments, uh, you know, because amortization means that it completely pays it off. If it doesn't pay it off, then there would be a balloon at the end that you would have to pay. Ashley, on the come up. Each January, a homeowner receives an estoppel certificate from his bank indicating the amount of real property taxes the homeowner will owe for the upcoming year, amount of principal remaining on the mortgage, closing costs incurred by the se in selling the home, or the amount of the taxes and insurance held in escrow, the estoppel certificate. Correct, amount of principal remaining on the mortgage. So think about a estoppel as like a stopping point on how much is owed on the property. So, or how much is left on the bill essentially. So they stop it, freeze it in time and say, right this minute, this is what uh, what's remaining on the mortgage. And that's what an estoppel certificate will give you. Which disclosure is not required by Regulation Z of the Truth in Lending Act? Total monthly payment, amount of interest to be paid, the appraisal fee, or the loan origination fee? The appraisal fee is not part of the loan. So that would be the only one. Everything else uh, they would need to have on there. Because truth in lending, you would need to know what your total monthly payment would be, uh, the amount of interest that you're paying, and what they're charging you for that loan. All of the following statutes require the disclosure of closing costs except Regulation Z, the FCRA, truth in lending, or RESPA. All right, FCRA, correct. If the price of carpeting is $19 per square yard, how much will it cost to carpet a room that is 15 by 15 feet? 19 by square, $19 a square yard, 15 by 15, 475, 750, 4,275 or 1,100. All right. So, you know, a lot of times you'll think, I, I don't have to know this stuff. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there are going to be lots of times where as the real estate expert, you're going to need to know um, how much does a hot water tank cost? How much is a remodel? How much would it be to do the floor? These are the things that you can factor into making offers. Um, and also as a seller's agent, if they come back and tell you, hey, it's going to cost $4,275 to carpet that room, you can be like, you're being robbed. You know, uh, I got a guy, do it for $475. So um, just know that knowing these things is important. Like, yeah, you can have a calculator to do it. And at the same time, just having a, a general knowledge of it 
uh, is also important to have as an agent. All right, where to go, Ashley? Typically, a developer builder would have which type of mortgage on his development? A wraparound, a partial release clause, interest only with annual payments due, conventional, fully amortized, or a blanket mortgage? Yeah, interest only. All right, blanket. Yeah, blanket, sorry. Um, blanket mortgage, because that would cover the different parcels uh, in order that they were building on. So uh, that's what the, the loan would cover multiple parcels. And I was thinking of flips. If I were doing a, a flip, I would have an interest only payment while I was doing the flip and then sell it. So uh, not, I was thinking of a different product. All right. RESPA regulations would not apply to loans for one to four family residences, the second subordinated lien for home equity loans, or a transaction financed solely by a purchase money mortgage taken by seller, or first lien residential mortgages. All right, good job. Uh, yeah, transaction finance solely by a purchase money mortgage taken by a seller. So uh, it's different than any of your first lien residentials or loan for family residences. Um, so, you know, just like it says, uh, it applies only to loans financed by federally regulated, re federally related mortgage loans. So, um, you know, if it's, if it's something that's been intended to be sold in the secondary market, uh, it would have to follow RESPA regulations. A GI loan is the same as a conventional loan, FHA loan, co-insured loan, or VA loan. VA. Yes, so GI um, refers to military. And so your VA is your veterans loan. So your, uh, your VA loan would be the same as a GI loan. Three to four in a row. If a property generates a gross rent income of $200,000, and a sales price of 3 million, what is the gross rent multiplier? Is it 30, 25, 18, or 15? Right, so sales price divided by rent equals the gross rent multiplier. Ashley, Rita. So when are you taking this test, Steph? Looks like you're ready. I still need another week or so. Okay, another week or so. But I have it scheduled, so. Good, good. All right. So. Next week we'll do uh, we'll do contracts, and I, I also want to uh, you know I've got nine minutes. Uh, let's talk about what real estate looks like after your exam. Um, who has questions about getting started, what to do, uh, where to go? I do. I have a question. So you mentioned okay. so you mentioned a database. Um, and, you know, you mentioned Facebook friends and things like that. So for the database that Keller Williams, that we have with Keller Williams, we, do we put name, address, phone number, like to start compiling our list? What, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean. Facebook friends, but I might not have all of their phone numbers. Right. 
So the, the thing is, is the most important stuff you mentioned, name, address, phone number, email. Mm-hmm. And if you get if you get those four things, your health score is going to look pretty good. Like, uh, hang on, I'll pull mine up and I'll show you. Okay. So here's my database health score. So phone number, email, address. And if you have address, you can put them into neighborhoods. Um, That's weird. That's weird. Is this mine? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got, so I've got one for the market center, uh, one for me personally, and then one for my team. Uh, So like uh, we can go to contacts. You all can see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I go to like a contact and I click them, then like she's got a a 64% health score. So I've got her name, I've got her phone number, I've got the email, but because I don't have an address in here, she's only at 64%. Um, And you can put all kinds of other information in here. Uh, You can put birthdays, home anniversaries, their relationships with other people, what company they are in. And like, you know, I put them on different smart plans. Like there was a Valentine's Day smart plan that, you know, happy Valentine's Day, whatever. Uh, you know, emails that are sent from here. So it sent an email on Valentine's uh, birthday smart plan saying, hey, we don't have your birthday. Um, So a lot of this is automated. So I just kind of set it and forget it. Uh, And then my assistant does a lot of the updating and stuff. Um, But your database is the most important part of your business. Um, Because if you look at, you know, I've got 2,034 people in my database and properly communicated with, that's gonna throw off about 16.4%. I'll get 16.4% of business out of that. Um, Your standard's around 10%. Um, So, you know, that's 200 deals out of that that database properly communicated with, Um, and even more. And, And again, this is, you know, people all over the country uh, because you can do, you can't do business personally, and you can refer them. And same thing with like, if I had a referral, you know, I would go in here and inside my system and just say, hey, I've got somebody looking in, you know, let's call it Chicago. Um, so I search in the map. I say Chicago, um, and then. It pulls up all the agents that are doing business out there uh, and their production. So I've got it on production level. Let's say they're a seller and I want somebody that, you know, does listings. So now it separates them by listings sold. So I can go in and see, okay, Frank Montro, and actually I've referred him business already. Um, He did 54 units in that area. He had 292 closed units, 210 listings sold. He did about... 58.8 58.8 million in volume in the last 12 months. So I know he's doing business. So, you know, that's the system that we have for referrals. And then, you know, as far, like I said, as far as going in and putting your contacts, name, phone number, email, address, uh, you get those. You can put their Facebook uh, account in there too. Um, but you get that stuff and then you can tag them so that you can filter them. Um, you know, so they're, they're all tagged. Um, and that way I can filter them out to however I want them. So, yeah, so, you know, database is going to be your most important thing, uh, as far as, you know, getting business going, and then you'll build on that database as you go.
Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Got three minutes. All right. Well, I will give you back three minutes of your life. You all have a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming. Um, we'll get on to contracts next week and uh, just kind of go back over and review some other things.